whispered horror. I am your host, Annabelle, and we will be reading from Carmilla, written by Joseph Sheridan Le Manu, Chapter One, An Early Fright. In Styria, we, though by no means magnificent people, inhabit a castle or schloss, a small income in that part of the world goes a great way. Eight or nine hundred a year does wonders. Scantily enough, ours would have answered among wealthy people at home. My father is English, and I bear an English name, although I never saw England. But here, in this lovely and primitive place, where everything is so marvelously cheap, I really don't see how ever so much more money would at all materially add to our comforts, or even luxuries. My father was in the Austrian service and retired upon a pension and his patrimony and purchased this feudal residence and the small estate on which it stands a bargain. Nothing can be more picturesque or solitary. It stands on a slight eminence in a forest. The road, very old and narrow, passes in front of its drawbridge, never raised in my time, and its moat stocked with perch, and sailed over by many swans, and floating on its surface, white fleets of water lilies. Over all this, the schloss shows its many-windowed front, its towers, and its Gothic chapel. The forest opens in an irregular and very picturesque glade before its gate, and at the right, a steep Gothic bridge carries the road over a stream that winds in deep shadow through of wood. I have said that this is a very lonely place. Judge whether I say the truth. Looking from the hall door towards the road, the forest in which our castle stands extends fifteen miles to the right and twelve to the left. The nearest inhabited village is about seven of your English miles to the left. The nearest inhabited schloss of any historic associations is that of old General Spielsdorf, nearly twenty miles away to the right. I have said the nearest inhabited village because there is only three miles westward, that is to say, in the direction of General Spielsdorf's Schloss, a ruined village, with its quaint little church now roofless, in the aisle of which are the moldering tombs of the proud family of Karnstein, now extinct, who once owned the equally desolate chateau, which in the thick of the forest overlooks the silent ruins of the town. Respecting the cause of desertion of this striking and melancholy spot, there is a legend which I shall relate to you another time. I must tell you now how very small is the party who constitute the inhabitants of our castle. I do not include servants or those dependents who occupy the rooms in the buildings attached to the schloss. Listen and wonder, my father, who is the kindest man on earth, but growing old, and I, at the date of my story, only nineteen. Eight years have passed since then. I and my father constituted the family at the Schloss. My 
hid herself under the bed. I was now for the first time frightened, and I yelled with all my might and main. Nurse, nursery maid, housekeeper, all came running in, and hearing my story, they made light of it, soothing me all they could meanwhile. But, child as I was, I could perceive that their faces were pale with an unwanted look of anxiety, and I saw them look under the bed and about the room, and peep under tables and pluck open cupboards, and the housekeeper whispered to the, the nurse, Lay your hand along that hollow in the bed. Someone did lie there, so sure as you did not. The place is still warm. I remember the nursery maid petting me, and all three examining my chest, where I told them I felt the puncture, and pronouncing that there was no sign visible that any such thing had happened to me. The housekeeper and two other servants who were in charge of the nursery remained sitting up all night, and from that time a servant always sat up in the nursery until I was about fourteen. I was very nervous for a long time after this. A doctor was called in. He was pallid and elderly. How well I remember his long, saturnine face, slightly pitted with smallpox, and his chestnut wig. For a good while, every second day, he came and gave me medicine, of which, of course, I hated. The morning after I saw this apparition, I was in a state of terror, and could not bear to be left alone daylight though it was, for a moment. I remember my father coming up and standing at the bedside and talking cheerfully, and asking the nurse a number of questions, and laughing very heartily at one of the answers, and patting me on the shoulder, and kissing me, and telling me not to be frightened, that it was nothing but a dream, and could not hurt me. But I was not comforted, for I knew the visit of the strange woman was not a dream, and I was awfully frightened. I was a little consoled by the nursery maids assuring me that it was she who had come and looked at me, and lain down beside me in the bed, and that I must have been half dreaming not to have known her face. But this, though supported by the nurse, did not quite satisfy me. I remembered in the course of that day a venerable old man in a black cassock coming into the room with the nurse and housekeeper and talking a little to them and very kindly to me. His face was very sweet and gentle, and he told me they were going to pray and joined my hands together, and desired me to say softly while they were praying, Lord, hear all good prayers for us, for Jesus' sake. I think these were the very words, for I often repeated them to myself, and my nurse used to for years make me say them in my prayers. I remembered so well the thoughtful, sweet face of that white-haired old man in his black cassock, as he stood in that rude, lofty brown room, with the clumsy furniture of a fashion of three hundred years old about him, and the scanty light entering its shadowy atmosphere through the small lattice. He kneeled, and the three women with him, and he prayed aloud with an earnest, quavering voice for what appeared to me a long time. I forget all my life preceding that event, and for some time after it is all obscure also, but the scenes I have just described stand out 
vivid as the isolated pictures of the phantasmagoria surrounded by darkness. That concludes today's episode of Whispered Horror. Tune in next time to continue listening to Camilla by Joseph Sheridan Lefanu. Thank you so much for listening, and remember, it's okay to be afraid of the dark. <laughs>